I want to implore you, please listen to the Word of God. Read the Scripture. Put it in your heart and in your mind. There is no power of God in the life of His people apart from His Word. Period. So we can come to all sorts of things. We can, um, we can consider all different ways to approach life, but without the Scripture, there is no life. There's no life in us without the Scripture. For Jesus Christ is the Word, and in His Word we find life. We finish the prologue of John's Gospel. And what you're going to find now as we move now into week 12 of this teaching um, is that we have an extreme change in tone, an extreme change in the literature itself. I mean, think about what we've learned over the last 12 weeks. We have come to the Scripture seeing all the incredible intricacies of God's glory, looking at Jesus Christ as the incarnate Word, who is the God of eternity, who was here in the beginning, who is God and was with God and created all things. We see that God, uh, as Jesus Christ, who is God, has, has established and perfected salvation and redemption of His people. That He is the light of the life of men. And so on and so on. We've seen the inability of men to be able to see and behold the glory of God through the face of Jesus Christ. Except that God do a mighty work of regenerating them and opening our eyes and opening our hearts and minds to see and believe. We've, we've seen just in the prologue the outline of the gospel. Of how the rest of, this, the rest of these chapters, all 21 of them, are going to continue to illustrate... The, the, the focus on Jesus Christ, the focus on the redemption of God, the focus on those who cannot believe are actually enabled to believe because of the grace of God and the power of God. We've seen that those who believe, those who receive Jesus positively in the context of their faith have, have, have been born not of their will or their decision or their bloodline or their genealogy or their ministry or their heritage, but they've been born of God. And we will see all of these things played out. But in verse 6 of the prologue, we see now there was a man sent from God. And we know that that is a, a, a sort of a preview of the, um, of the evangelist who we know as John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, it's important to understand that in this prologue, as we see this outline, then we see, starting in verse 19, which is where we'll be this morning, which will be in verses 19 through 28, that the outline there in verse 6, 7, and 8 of John 1 actually begins to unfold, starting in verse 18. So we'll see this morning that John the Baptist was the man sent from God, verse 6, whose name was John. Verse 7, he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. Verse 8, he was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. And the, and the certainty then, within who is the light, see verse 9, the true light, who is Jesus Christ, was coming into the world. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, came into the world. Through Jesus Christ comes grace and truth. Through Moses, the law was given. We looked at the contrast that there is no salvation in the law. There is no salvation at all in any obedience. There is no pleasing in the pleasure of God looking upon us graciously because we live a certain way or act a certain way or dress a certain way or speak a certain way or eat a certain way, etc. that makes God pleased with us. Salvifically, God is only pleased Righteously, God is only pleased. In His holiness, God is only pleased through the obedience of the God-man, Jesus Christ. There has been no other man or woman or child who has existed or will ever exist on earth that satisfies God's holy requirements to be perfect and holy and righteous and just, just as I am, says God, except Jesus Christ, who is the God of heaven, become flesh. What I want us to see here is that as we get started to be reminded of these things is that John's testimony is not exclusive. Though it says there in verse 7, he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. And if you remember when we preached that some weeks ago, I talked about God's sovereign, 
sovereign decree, his purpose and plan of how he established John the Baptist to be the precursor of his earthly ministry before John the Baptist ever existed, before the world ever existed, so that God's grace toward his people is eternal. It is not something that he decided upon, it is something that he's always desired, something that he's always purposed. It's a very troubling mystery for us. But sometimes we take, just as we've been studying Romans on our midweek service on Wednesdays, sometimes we take what we see in Scripture and we want to identify ourselves with people like John the Baptist. We want to identify ourselves with people like the Apostle Paul. Or we want to be like Peter. And we start saying, well, I want to be like this guy, or I want to be like this guy, or I want to be like this person. And we try to find a personality in the Old or New Testament to which we can uh, affix ourselves and our character and our calling and our personality and our life, etc. But friends, we cannot do that. For the standard alone is Jesus Christ. Paul would tell the church of Ephesus that the purpose of the church, one of the purposes of the church is to grow up into the full maturity of manhood, which is the stature of Jesus and His humanity, that absolute perfection. And it's not long before he gives that instruction that he's told just how the church establishes such righteousness, and that is through the obedience of Jesus Christ. That we are not able to, in the best of our morality, uphold any of the law of God in any, in, in any essence, none whatsoever. And if we did, let's just say that we did. Let's just say that the Scripture didn't say that the righteous works of men are filthy rags. Let's just pretend that's not in there for a moment. Even if we did, we cannot fully keep it. So though we may muster up some good morals and some good ethics, which are required of us, required of all humanity, even unbelievers have that requirement. It is not effectual for God's pleasure toward us. We don't get rewarded for doing that which we are supposed to do, but definitely we are going to pay the consequences of failing to do that which is required of us. Which is why the gospel is called the gospel. It's why it's called the good news. It's why we are here in this text this week and over the next few years to grow as a people into maturity, to understand that we're not looking at the standard of John the Baptist as our ministry. What a weak and pathetic standard. What a worthless standard, as we'll see in just a minute. We're not trying to be the Apostle Paul, who was an absolute loser. We're not trying to be the Apostle James. We're not looking to try to be anything except to follow after Christ. And follow after Christ by faith that we might fulfill the righteous requirements of the law, not in our flesh and in our abilities, but by trusting in the one who did. As we learned yesterday in our men's gathering, that faith that saves is faith in the one who justifies. And the one who justifies is the one who has given us the, righteous, the righteousness of the one who has obeyed. And he is Jesus Christ. That is what salvation is. That Christ has atoned for our sins and he's satisfied the wrath of God. That we no longer are held accountable. We no longer have the burden of trying to overcome the guilt of our sinfulness. Because Jesus Christ has taken not only our guilt, but he's taken, our, he's taken the command of our obedience upon himself and fulfilled it perfectly. So friends, we don't come today to try to see that John the Baptist is our standard. We are not here today to model our lives after John the Baptist. We are here today that we might grow in the likeness of Christ through grace by the Word of God, being indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes also in our culture, we think that certain peoples are called out to evangelism and that those are the peoples through which God is going to expand His kingdom. You might find it very interesting that after, after John the Baptist was murdered, after he was killed by the order of Herod's, the order of Herod actually against his best desires, after his head was taken from his body and placed on a silver platter and brought before him, that there were no more evangelists. There were no more evangelists coming. The apostles didn't come around and start saying, okay, we've got to get evangelists, we've got to do this, we've got to do that. But, but who were the evangelists? The people of God. The small, minute, silent, sometimes undetectable witness of the most insignificant persons, like the woman of Sychar became an evangelist, where she went back to her town, having been a fallen woman, living in sin, but greatly despised by the piety of those people who were rejected by God, not only, not only in, in genealogically and historically, but by their own self-righteousness. She was rejected by them because she did not live the life that they thought she should live. She was rejected by them because she had many lovers. She was rejected by them because she was considered a harlot. 
And yet she became an evangelist to the people of Sychar. She comes to Sychar in John chapter 4 and she says, Behold, I've met a man that has told me everything that I've ever done. Could he be Messiah? And later on in that discourse and that understanding of what we see that John recorded, we see that the narrative goes sort of like this. She became an evangelist to bear witness about the light who was Jesus Christ who offered her living water that she did not understand. And then all of a sudden, the witness of this Samaritan woman transferred to no longer be of importance, did it? Because the witness that she bore began to point to whom? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the light. He's the truth. He is the way. And so they begin to look at Christ and they actually testify. It is no longer what you have told us is why we believe, but because we have seen and heard it with our own eyes and ears. We believe we have a testimony of Jesus. And that's what John is recording here with John the Baptist. He was just the first. And yes, the words of John the Baptist are not recorded at length. The ministry of John the Baptist was very short. It was very weak. But it was very powerful. And he's not a special someone to be exalted or admonished. Why do we do that? We'll look at it later. But ultimately, what I want you to see is that as we begin, the testimony of John the Baptist is not exclusive. It's not exclusive. This is not the evangelist for Jesus. He is just the beginning. He was the beginning of the human witness in the world. He was the one through whom all men would be made aware of the true light. And it is his testimony that was given to us that John would even exclaim in his first epistle that which was from the beginning has been manifest to us and we now proclaim to you. Beloved, let us not fall after the devil's trap of thinking that the evangelism is the call of some people. It is the call of pastors. It's not the call of pastors. It is the call of evangelists. It's not the call of evangelists. It's the call of every human being who bears the name Christ. It is the call and the command of everyone who has the banner of God in Jesus Christ. Just as we look at, the, as we look at Paul's writing to Timothy and then also to Titus as he shows the, 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 the whole and the combination of those attributes and the things that ought to be continually watched and guarded for those men who call themselves elders and overseers. These are not specifically for them. This is for the whole of every Christian. It is why church membership is necessary. It is why church discipline is necessary. Anyone who, does, who fails to meet these things in the assembly is put out of the assembly if they are not corrected. But see, we often think that pastors are held to a different standard. We're not. Evangelists held to a different standard. Apostles held to a different standard. We are all one body, so what standard would there be of holiness and righteousness and cleanliness for my right hand that my left hand would not also have to follow? Or what, 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 what sterile environment would need to be for my eye that would not also be for my mouth? Or for my ears or for my heart? We have to pay close attention that we're not putting a light on those who preach and not putting a light of adoration on those who speak. And not putting a light of honor and glory on those who are witnesses of Jesus. Because, beloved, we're all witnesses of Jesus. And through the frailest of witness, God can bring the greatest of life. John was the first domino, is the way I look at it, in a long succession of believers. And he came and he tilted over... And as he tilted, he knocked himself into the next. And as we see these, this effect, beloved, look around. We are all witnesses of Jesus. I mean, even the cults understand that somewhat. The Jehovah's Witnesses understand that each of them are vitally necessary to the continuation of the <laughs> exposing the light of who they call as God in error. John 15, 16, Jesus says these words. You'll have to go there. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and hear these words carefully. Bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, it may give it to you. Now for those of you who have been with us on Wednesdays, you understand that the apostolic authority brought with it absolute supernatural certainty of salvation. That when the apostles' teaching went out into the world, people came to faith. It wasn't like the days of Jeremiah or Noah. 
where they just didn't listen. They didn't hear. Some did not hear, but many believed. Beloved, I believe that that's the same place we are today. In the age of the church, that if we take the Word of God out, people will be saved. Why aren't people coming to faith? Because in a hundred people, maybe one might share it. In a thousand people, maybe ten might share it. The fruit that Jesus is talking about in John 15, of course, we can always kick the can back to faith alone in Him. But the abiding and the growth of that fruit, what? Is that more people would come to, to come to believe. The fruit of those apostles is that they would continue to teach. The fruit of the church is that it is growing. But see, we have, we have manipulated, we've been manipulated by the culture in which we live. And over the last few hundred years, we've seen incredible demise to the power of the gospel. We've seen that people are more willing to invest time in relationships and try to get people's morals and ethics transferred rather than just proclaiming the simplicity of the gospel that all men are subject to the wrath of God's righteousness and are guilty before Him. But Jesus Christ took it and has, been, has proven Himself to be God and been raised from the dead. That if you believe that God saved you through Christ, you have eternal life. Why is it so hard to, to, to pull that question, or that statement rather, out of our mouths? I don't know. There's been many things that I've written through the years that I've posited, many philosophies that I've considered. But ultimately, we go to Ephesians 6 to realize that there is a war against us. That we'd rather consider our, uh, our lives and the time that we have of how we're going to become better. Or how we're going to be closer of what we're going to do and how our life's going to be affected. When the very nature of the church is that we're considering the lives of each other. That we're considering how we might make disciples of one another. How we might grow and in our weakness someone else is having to carry that like a burden. And then we are also carrying the burden of others in their weakness. So that we might grow in the unity of the faith. The evangel, the good news, the gospel. It's not just John the Baptist. It's not exclusive. The fruit of the church is the continued witness of Jesus Christ to the world. And beloved, these statements are not made to bring guilt. If you have guilt in your heart and conscience right now, you're not hearing the gospel. For therefore now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why then, pray tell, should we have guilt in our own consciousness about what God has said we are no longer guilty for? We are free, beloved, for the Son has set us free. Let us rise. If we forget to eat this morning because of time or poor planning, do we blow ourselves off of eating forever? Do we agonize over the fact that we skipped a meal? Poor food that didn't get eaten. Poor body that didn't get filled. Oh, woe is me. I'm a horrible person because I didn't consume my breakfast. But no, but we do that when we do not consume the Word. We do that when we do not pray effectually or as often as we should. We do not do that when we miss out on church for no good reason because we're just busy or tired or weak. We beat ourselves up when we fail to share the gospel. Oh, I'm so guilty. But that is not the place of the Christian. I am guilty of not doing that which God's called me to do. I am guilty of not fulfilling the call of God in my life perfectly. But Christ... It's my refuge. In Him shall I hide. On the rock that I shall stand. He is the foundation of my faith. So I stand bold before the throne of grace, not the throne of judgment. The witness of Christ is not the role of a few, a, a few zealous, a few zealots, but of every small, insignificant, minute believer whom Christ has saved. Now let's look at it. Let's get that introduction in verses 6 to 9 very quickly as a way of reminder. There was a man sent from God whose name was John 1, 6, 7, 8, and 9. He came, to bear, came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light but came to bear witness about the light. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Several things in, rem, in, in reminder. He was sent from God but was not the light. Hear that. He was sent from God, but was not the light. Now, what, is, what should we take away from this? Because what you'll see in John's answers, the Pharisees have sent some priests and some Levites to go inquire. And you'll find it very interesting why they're upset. As you see the text here, it spells it out. 
But as we look at that, what we'll see is in these first few verses, there are these three things. He was sent by God, but He was not the light. He was sent to bear witness that all might believe through Him. Those three things. These next three sections of John the Baptist's testimony illustrates those three things. So remember we telling you over the last 11 weeks, this is an outline for the entire text. It's there. It starts here. And so here is this not the light. Well, why is that important? So people don't look at John. So people don't follow John. So people don't look after John's ministry. So people don't covet John's ministry. So people don't say, well, I'm a disciple of John. Is this not the very thing that happened? Is it not the, the disciples of John coming to him and saying, look, look at our, look at our, look at your disciples going to Jesus. And John says, the bridegroom gets the bride. I must decrease so that he may increase. And God's ordained purpose in that was that his head would be taken from his body. John, even in prison, said, you know what? I need you guys to go and watch Jesus a little bit because I might have made a big mistake. That's a paraphrase. That's what happened though. John was in the midst of his imprisonment, facing, facing execution. He was thinking, well, maybe I have made a mistake. I, I might have picked the wrong guy. Behold, the Lamb of God. Oh my goodness, did I point to the wrong man? Did I baptize the wrong one? Did the voice I hear from heaven, was it fake? And can you imagine? Why? Because that's what our flesh does. But He's not the light. Let's, let's apply that to our own lives for a moment. We are not the light for people. We are not the answer to other people's problems. We are not the rock on which other people can stand. We are not the shoulder in which we will carry them through the burdens of this life. We are not the ones that will save anyone. We're not. And others, others cannot use us as their excuse. Well, James didn't lead me the, rec the correct way. So it goes both ways. We can't look to someone else and say, well, they're, 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 they're the reason. They're the one. They left. I remember leaving a pastor at one time and having a support group of men Four men. And then when I left, 80% of those men went back into addiction because I was no longer there. And I got a letter from one of their wives about six months after just basically condemning me because I dared to follow God someplace else because I was the reason that her husband went back to drugs. And I believed that it was. That's not what Scripture teaches. That's not what Scripture teaches. If we are looking to each other as our hope, we have lost sight of the light. John the Baptist was not the light. We are not the change agent for salvation. Yes, can we encourage each other? Absolutely. Are we supposed to? Yes. That's the reason we assemble together. That we learn together and grow together and pray together and worship together and encourage each other and be accountable and step on each other's toes and wipe each other's uh, feet off a little bit sometimes in service and all sorts of things. But we do it. But none of us can actually change the other. Only God can do that. Only Christ can change us. Only the gospel can change us. Only the word can change us. So we're off the hook. We point people to Jesus. We teach them the Scriptures. We pray for them. We share life with them. We carry each other's burdens. But the, all the while, we're pointing to the light. We're pointing to the light. We're pointing to the light. Well, I just can't do that, some people tell me. There's no way I can do what you're telling me to do. I'm not telling you to do it. The Scripture's telling you to do it. So God's telling you to do it. Jesus says you've been equipped to do it. So do it. Well, I can't. You've spoken well that you say you can't. So I'm trying to be like Jesus and... You've spoken the truth when you said you have no husband. But you've had four. And the man you live with now is not your husband. We are to recognize that we're not the light. We're to point people to Christ. Share the witness of Christ. Teaching scripture. Teaching the gospel. Praying for others. And the outcome of it all is not that people's lives would be changed. And this is going to sound so antithetical to what we think as, 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 as American Christians, but our purpose in being together and sharing the gospel is not for a changed life. That's what 40 Days of Purpose would tell you. That's what Purpose in Church would tell you. That's what all this secret sensitivity will tell you. It's we're not trying to change people's lives. I mean, because I, I could, with psychology, change people's lives. I could, with, I could, with magic tricks, change people's lives. If I, take, if I take some illusions that I've been doing since I was six years old, and I mean, I had a woman one time that I produced a, a coin and then a sponge ball, a, I mean, a clown nose type thing from nothing. 
in the mall of Roanoke when me and a fellow magician were standing there. She comes up and says, what do y'all do? Oh, we're, we're magicians. We're tricksters. We're just sort of talking shop right here. We're actually having a Bible study, but she interrupted it. She says, well, I, I was in India one time and I saw a man who could produce matter. And we just looked at each other and got this kiddish six-year-old grin in our face. She's like, oh, wow. You mean like that? You know? Oh! <gasps> Oh my gosh, y'all have that gift, y'all have that gift. I said, woman, if I could produce matter, I wouldn't be making sponges and retired copper. <laughs> We'd be making some gold or whatever it might be. But she was convinced we, were, we had powers. So we could, change, we could change her life. I could have changed her life to make her think I was a man with power. She'd have followed me anywhere, given me anything. We can change people's life by giving them a lot of money. We can change people's life by taking everything they have. We could encourage people and give them good self-esteem and their life could change. We could sit them in front of a motivational speaker and tell them that they can do anything that they ever wanted to do, which is a lie. And their life will be changed. The church has no business in trying to make people's lives change. You might say, what? I'm confused and what are we supposed to do? Listen, we're looking for salvation, not life change. Now surely salvation brings life change, but it's usually not for the better. It's usually not for a happy-go-lucky, free life of just kicking our heels up. Wow, what a great feeling. I'm thinking of Toyota commercials now in my head for some reason. Gosh, I guess that might have been a slogan. No, we're to point people to Christ so that they might believe. Believe, not change, not transform. The outcome is not change. The outcome is belief. The outcome is the glory of God through the salvation of His people. That's the point. That's the point. That's why when you hear us talk all the time, Jesse and I, we always say, we've got to preach the gospel to ourselves. We've got to preach the gospel to each other. One of the greatest misapplications in the New Testament church that's been perpetrated by the devil for many, 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 many years is that the scripture and the gospel is for the unbeliever. And when they get it, then we've got to do other things. Listen, friends. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Peter says that the divine power of God is everything we need for life and godliness. So if the divine power of God is everything we need for life and godliness and the power of God is the gospel, then the gospel is the power of God for everything we need for life and godliness. That's the argument. <laughs> Sorry. I might have lost you. I was a little fast. So then, John was sent to bear witness about the light that all men might believe through him. Let's look at the text. In John 1, 19 through 28. I'll read it and then we'll go through it one at a time. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask, Who are you? He confessed and he did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, Make straight, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. And these things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. Now let's think about this for a second. I am very difficult to please when it comes to exposition and commentary. I'm not going to lie. I'm also going to confess to you today is because I am, have incredibly weird nuances about people missing things that I seem to think are important that probably aren't as important as they should be. Sometimes I get overwhelmed with preaching and will belabor a verse to the point where it actually doesn't go. But in my futility, the futility of my flesh, those are the things I do by the grace of God. Maybe He will communicate some things to us. So this morning, Without trying to overdo, I would like to finish these verses and focus on some of the key things that I believe this text is teaching. First, and this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask, Who are you? Now, why did they go 
You see, this is what, why, why did they go? Because they wondered. Why did they wonder? Because they heard. Why did they hear? Because he's preaching. And masses of people are listening, and then masses of people are coming to him, and he's dunking them in the water. In the River Jordan, publicly, as a sign that they are clean in Christ Jesus, the coming one, the Messiah, the one who's coming, the kingdom of heaven. You know, they are believing. That's, that's the point. And so now all of a sudden, the Jews, that's the Pharisees, as we see down in verse 24. I think it is. Yeah. Send a posse of Levites. These are the ones who work. And priests who are also of the tribe of Levi. But Levites, I mean, they're the workers. They're the strong men who carry around heavy things. And so I suppose that they sent the priests because they're the ones who have the authority to go out and inquire. Because they're the ones who know exactly. And, and some people say, well, they're the, they were the Sadducees. There's no, there's no point to say that. We don't know that. Because when the Sadducees are discovered or discussed in this gospel, they call them Sadducees. Yes, Sadducees were priests, but they weren't very spiritual. Matter of fact, they didn't, they didn't hardly even, they weren't orthodox at all. They just sort of did their own thing and did their own religious way. And they wouldn't care about prophets. They wouldn't care. So we believe that some of the Jewish priests were sent and then the Levite men, the bodybuilders, if you will, were going along to keep the peace in case John the Baptist and some of his people get a little fruity, get a little cocky, a little froggy, whatever you want to call it. They didn't want a problem. So they sent these group, this group of people. And the reason that they wanted to know is because they had a responsibility first to Israel. They had a responsibility given to them in the law that says that if a false prophet teaches in my name but he's not sent by me, kill him. <laughs> That's what it says. He must die. Now, of course, they couldn't kill him. They eventually kill someone. Who is it? Stephen. Acts chapter 6 and 7. They eventually kill Stephen under the very law that they're governing the inquiry of John the Baptist right now. So they'd heard all of these rumors. They'd heard the people. It was a buzz. Ask yourself this question. When was the last time the gospel was a buzz in your life? When was the last time the gospel was a buzz in a community, in a church even? I mean, what's usually, what's usually the buzz around the people? What we're doing, what we own, where we're going. What else? You put anything into that category. But the light is Jesus. So if we as the church are to be known for something, we should be known for pointing to Christ. Though it is a burden at times, and it, you hate it when people don't like you, that's one of my biggest problems. I want everybody to like me. And if I weren't guided in some sense, no, in all senses, by the confines of the Scripture, I would be the worst panderer it make politicians look solid. Because I want everybody to like me. Oh, you know, I hate cheese, cream cheese. Oh, you, you like it? Well, I love cream cheese. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to offend your cream cheese favor. John was not pointing to himself. We should not point to ourselves. When people say, you know, I can't handle verse-by-verse -verse teaching. I can't handle... Hearing the scripture, I can't handle the fact that the God of Romans 1 is the same God of John 3. And I hear that. And I want to I do sympathize with these people, but at the same time, what is most important? That we point to Christ, not placate to people who we want to be in a relationship with. Are you hearing me? John the Baptist could easily have said, I'm Messiah. Or I'm the prophet. And they would have backed up and left him alone. Somebody comes, you know what? I think you're a prophet. That's what John 4 is the fourth time I've referred to that again today. I perceive you a prophet. For you know things about me that I don't know. Riddle me this then, prophet. And she goes on about some spiritual things and more importantly about some religious traditions. And here... They say, who are you? You're preaching, you're proclaiming, you're making a buzz. Everybody's talking about you, John. And we need to know who you are. And more importantly, by whose authority do you come? And they ask him very clearly. 
Who are you? Now, there have been a lot of false prophets. We see three that are mentioned in Scripture. One, uh, what's his name? Theudas. Theudas. However you would say that. Acts chapter 5. He rose up claiming to be somebody. And the Scripture says he had about 400 men. And then they killed him and his men scattered. And then later on in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 5, it talks about another prophet that rose up had 4,000 men that he led into the wilderness and they killed him and then all 4,000 of those men scattered. So here's another guy preaching and doing and preaching and doing and getting a gathering. Does this sound familiar? It's called church planting in the 21st century. Church planting, cult planting, whatever you want to call it. Let's go do our thing and let's, gray, let's get a big crowd that will give us their money and their time and their attention and they'll center it all on us and we'll put it all together and then we'll be a force to be reckoned with. The only difference in today's culture and that culture is that they would kill you if you upset the apple cart. Much like when Paul and the apostles preached in Ephesus and people stopped buying the wares of idolatry. He didn't even preach against it. He just preached the truth of Jesus. And Jesus saved people. And they no longer worshipped idols. Isn't that crazy? But another reason why they would ask is because in some sense they also were hoping for Messiah. I mean, was not Zechariah when John the Baptist, when he was told that he would give us, have a son? Remember this? You see it in the very first part of Luke. When he goes in, it's his time. The lot came up for him to go give the sacrifice in the Holy of Holies. And all of a sudden, he comes and, 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 and he's looking for Messiah. And he goes out and he tells at the birth of John. He tells everybody's all of us. And he says, look, the angel came to me. And his name's going to be John. And this is what's going to happen. And the temple he's dedicated. And it says that all the people were inquiring about this young man. Because they knew he was going to be somebody. There's a paraphrase here. So what does God do when people are going to run after this child? Imagine that child growing up in Judea. In the religious center of Israel. He would have been made a king. He would have been put on the throne. He would have been all sorts of things coming. So what happens is that John the Baptist becomes a, a weird guy living in the woods, eating bugs, and wearing animal clothes. So that he doesn't fit the norm of society. They were hoping for Messiah. The Roman occupation was very grievous. But the biggest thing is that they were inquiring on his authority. So often, so many people are consumed with their own message and their own mission and their own ministry that they offend the name of Christ. Such were the Jews. John the Baptist was getting so much attention that the attention was being taken from the Pharisees. We're not teaching these people anymore. They're listening to John. John is talking about the kingdom of God at hand, and here we are being pushed aside. These are all things that possibly were on their mind. But what does he say when they say, Who are you? The Bible says in verse 20, He confessed, but he did not deny, but confessed. Now, why the, what's that? He wasn't denying, No, 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 I'm not the Christ. He confessed it. That was an, that's an imperative. He says, boldly proclaiming in the first person, I am not the Christ. That's what it says. He's not saying, no, 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 I'm not the Christ. That's a denial. <laughs> not me. No. He says, I am not the Christ. What does that tell you? What does that sound like? No, 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 not me. But he's going to say in a minute, but he stands among you and you don't know him. He deny, he does not deny, but he confess, I'm not the Christ. John answers this way very quickly. They don't even ask him if he's the Christ, but he'd heard the rumors as well. Can you imagine? I mean, think of what we can know. If you tweet one thing I say today, friends of mine in Malaysia will talk about it with me tonight. Now, where in the world? That's a lot of power communicating. The problem is we don't communicate anything worth listening to most of the time as a culture. Let's change that as the church. He wanted to remove any hint of rumor. But see, today in our culture, if you're mistaken for a celebrity, if you're mistaken for someone who's famous, we sort of like that. Well, they said I look like so-and-so. Yeah, that's me. 
I mean, we have pretenders all the time that are changing their look and changing their dress and changing their hair so they would resemble someone who's very famous and adored for no reason except that everybody knows them and adores them. But John the Baptist was not like that. His desire was not to be looked upon, to be seen. His desire was to point to Christ who is Messiah. He says, I am not the Messiah. There is one who is. There is one and He's here. Remember what we've already talked about. We are not the agent of change. We are not the prime being. We are not the essential character. Jesus is the essential character. Jesus is the prime being. Jesus is the agent of change. And it goes on to say that even the church, we as a gathered people are not the agent of change. We are not. Our ministry is not. The preaching ministry of this, of this pulpit is not. Jesus Christ is the agent of change. No matter what we do, no matter how we pray, no matter what we preach, if Christ does not change people, if Christ does not save people, if Christ does not work His Word into the hearts and lives of people, there is no fruit. There is no salvation. But the only way God saves is through the hearing of His Word. Jesus Christ must be made known. And we are to point to Him, beloved. If we don't get anything else out of this sermon today, that's the most important thing. It's not even about Grace Truth Church. Yes, we may hold to an orthodox, foundational doctrinal statement. We may hold to, to the essentials of what churchmanship is, which is exposition and prayer and hearing the Word and praising God like we see in Colossians chapter 3. We may follow after the precepts of the traditions of the church historically, like baptism and the Lord's table. If we don't pray that God would do a work through the ministry, through the teaching, through His Word, Nothing, nothing, nothing happens. And we could draw crowds who are desperate to find such a fellowship all over the country. I want to find a fellowship like this. I'm going to move my family. That's great. But are you coming for the fellowship or are you coming for the Savior? Are we coming for the preaching or are we coming for the message of the cross? Are we coming to Christ? Are we here this morning... Because what happens in the context of our assembly points us to Jesus. And if it doesn't, give me the right foot of fellowship and I'll correct it. So he says emphatically, I'm not the Christ. I am not the Christ. And they ask him, verse 21, what then? If you're not Messiah, who are you? By the way, Messiah is the Hebrew word for Christ. Holy, anointed, one of God. That's what it means. If you're not Christ, then are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He says, no. I mean, imagine this inquiry going on and on and on here, outside in public. But see, people would ask, well, why would they ask if he was Elijah? Elijah's been dead for a long, long time because the Scripture says that Elijah would come. And Malachi 4, the last prophecy of the Old Testament, says that Elijah would come. Jesus even calls John the Baptist Elijah in 1712. But he says it this way, But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man, that's himself, will certainly suffer at their hands. The spirit of Elijah... In Luke 1 17 and it will go before him in the spirit of the power of Elijah to turn the heads of the fathers to the children the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared and so in the spirit of Elijah means with the same manner the same heart the same words same message why because Jesus Christ is God he's immutable he doesn't change the message never changes though the mouth might though the messenger could be anyone the message is solid and stays the same. Who is this prophet? <laughs> Deuteronomy 18.15 is where we see this and Moses writing these words and, and, and we hear the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me among you from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And so some of the Jews there historically, well, who's this unknown prophet? Most of tradition, most of Hebrew tradition thought it would be Jeremiah who had a fruitless ministry 
running for his life, being hated, stoned, killed. He preached the, he preached the truth and they want to kill him. It wasn't Jeremiah. Jesus Christ was the prophet that Moses was speaking of. And it wasn't going to be Elijah reincarnated. That's something a lot of people don't realize is that Jews, historically, have always been believed in reincarnation. Even in the context of their law about a brother who's, who dies and his other brother should take his wife. Why? Because if they have a son, the spirit of the older brother goes into the son. That's what they believed. Where do you get that stuff? Jewish writings. It became... It became what do you call that? <laughs> Witchcraft, I guess. So he says, I'm not Elijah and I'm not the prophet. So then they ask again, who are you then? They won't take these answers. They don't care that he's not these people. They want to know exactly who he is. And you might find it interesting to figure out why. Because some of us right now, all, as we're listening to this, see how different this is than the other 11 weeks? It's a narrative. It's a discourse between groups of people. We have to figure out the essence of what's being said here based on the context of Scripture. John the Baptist is being drilled with questions. And he's answering them, but they don't like his answers. So they keep going after him. Then who are you? Some of us would say, this is what I was going to say, well, you know, it's because he's preaching. He's preaching a message that's contrary. No, he's preaching a message that actually works within the confines of their understanding of Scripture. That's why they said, are you Messiah? They were waiting on Messiah. Well, if you're not Messiah, maybe you're Elijah. Well, if you're not Elijah, maybe you're Jeremiah. Or maybe that unknown prophet. You've got to be somebody. We know, and we know John 3, the Pharisees have come to conclude that Jesus is what? Messiah. For we believe... That you are from God, for no one can do the things you do except God be with them. We need to give an answer to those who sent us. So see, they weren't even inquiring. They weren't even the ones that really were interested in it more, but they were just sent. The Pharisees, as we'll see in verse 24, it, it's put there. Now, some of you may not even care about this, but for those of you who do study some of these things, especially parentheticals in, in the New Testament, a lot of people in higher criticism would say, well, now there's a second group here. It's not a second group. It's one conversation. And it's just reminding us that the Pharisees sent them, the Jews sent them for the, for the purpose of understanding the text. We want to give an answer. And so what does he say, verse 23? I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. I read that entire chapter of Isaiah 40, beginning of the service. But in verses 3, 4, and 5 of Isaiah 40, it says that, And the voice cries, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. So the valley's low, it shall be lifted up. Every mountain which is high shall be made low. Every uneven ground shall become level, and rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, together, for the mouth of the Lord is spoken. So here, his answer, what do you say about yourself? He actually says, I am the voice that Isaiah spoke of. And now they're going, what in the world is happening? Now, you may not see this, but he actually rebuked them right there. They should know. They should know. They should know just like Nicodemus knew when he says, what am I to do? Go back into my mother's womb and come out again and that's my rebirth. What am I to do? How am I to be born again? And Jesus says like the wind blows where it wishes and does what it does, so the Spirit of God blows as it wishes and does what it does. No one can see it. No one can call it. No one can command it. It's going to do what it's going to do. Only one who can see, only one who can know what the Father knows is the one who comes from heaven. And I've come down from heaven. The Son of Man has come down from heaven and will return to heaven. Nicodemus was still confused. What, what, I, I'm confused. <laughs> Nicodemus, aren't you the teacher of all Israel? You do not understand these things. How can you understand spiritual things if you do not understand earthly things? I should tell you something, beloved. None of us are too dumb to understand the Bible. But yet, we're too smart to understand the Bible. 
Nicodemus was smart, the Pharisees were smart, the Jews were smart, and they knew everything, yet they couldn't see it unfolding in front of their eyes. They were blinded, according to Isaiah chapter 6, according to John 12. And they could not see because it had not been given them to understand the simplicity of what was happening before them. They could not see, if we can use the phrase, the handwriting on the wall, which comes from the Old Testament, by the way. We could, they could not see it. They could not see their nose in front of their face. They could not see the forest with the trees. They could not understand the simplicity of the fact that Jesus Christ and the heralder of the gospel the, to present Jesus as the kingdom of God come to earth was right there in front of them. And he quotes their own prophet. And I'm here to tell you, he says, make straight the way of the Lord. And he's talking to the most passionate, zealous bunch of people for righteousness and piety that has ever lived. And he just told them to make their lives straight. To make their hearts straight. You know what he goes on to say later? He uses a word to encompass that. Repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. And see, sometimes, remember what I talked about in the beginning about the righteousness of Christ? Sometimes we think repentance is changing our lives and changing our morals to fit more in line with Jesus. But the idea of repentance is changing our mind to recognize that our self-righteousness cannot put us just before God. Everybody that does what is dark can see it. No wicked person living in sin denies that they're sinning. That's why they hide. The Bible says, the Scripture, the discourse that Jesus had with these Pharisees, He even says, if your righteousness is not greater than that of the Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And no one lived more perfect lives than the Pharisees. No one loved Jehovah more than the Pharisees. No one read the Bible and prayed and did religious things more than the Pharisees. And so the people like the Christians in Rome, the Gentiles are like, whoa, whoa, whoa we're second class Christians. Repentance is about recognizing that even the most pious of approaches are worthless. In the economy of justice, in the economy of righteousness, and the economy of vengeance and wrath, which is good. John the Baptist, by, by approaching Isaiah chapter 40, is saying, I'm just a highway worker. I'm just a worker on the road. I'm clearing the path of the way of the Lord through the preaching of, of, of the truth that Jesus is here, that the kingdom has come. I'm laying down mountains and I'm filling up valleys and I'm making everything straight and I'm fixing all the mess that you've made Pharisees and priests and Levites for the last thousand years. I'm preaching the message that lays to waste everything you've preached. I'm laying the foundations and the borders and the shoulders of the gospel and pushing everything that you've done to the side. Everything that you have accomplished is just garbage in the ditch. That's what, that's what John the Baptist is saying. And he's pushing it out of the way. And he's saying, don't look at me. I'm just one guy with a shovel. And there are many of us. Look at where the road goes. Look at who's about to come. This is not a highway for you, Pharisee. This is a highway for the king. And he's about to come marching down it. You see? I pray the Lord will give you ears to hear that. He pushed over and paved over the falsehoods of self-righteousness. He paved over blindness. He paved over so that Jesus, who is the true light, who was coming into the world, could easily be seen. He's the paver, the straight maker. Or He was the pointer to the one who was really the straight maker, who is Jesus Christ the way. Verse 24 reminds us who sent them, the Pharisees. This is where the inquiry originated. They were upset because John the Baptist was on the scene and his ministry bothered them. Why? Was it his message? No. They didn't even get the message, you see. They were like, well, okay, whatever. They didn't get it. It was his practice. What was he doing? 
He said, then if you're not Messiah, and you're not Elijah, and you're not the prophet, why are you baptizing people? And you know who he was baptizing? John the Baptist didn't baptize Gentiles. He baptized Jews. Why would you baptize? Are you not the son of Zechariah, the priest? Don't you understand that priests are baptized symbolically? into their ministry and the only other people who are baptized are proselytes who come into Judaism and they baptize themselves who are you to dunk a Jew that's sort of what their question is I didn't mean for that to rhyme sorry <laughs> who do you think you are dunking Jewish people there we go <laughs> sorry there's a t-shirt in there but that's what they were upset about. Because only priests had the authority to baptize and only the people who were baptized were converts to Judaism, not ethnic Israel. What are you doing? Why are you, that's why they were upset. But what authority, we don't have the authority, you don't have the authority, what are you doing? So if you're neither the Christ or Elijah the prophet, why are you baptized? The practice of baptism was the root of their inquiry, not the preaching. By whose authority do you come? If you're not one of the prophets, why in the world would you be doing this? Who are you to declare that you can baptize someone? In their minds, it was, a, it was not just a, it was a symbol, but it was also a, a reckoning in the context of that person being clean. They were bathed ritually through baptism and symbolically. It's not necessary to baptize Jews. We're, we're okay in Abraham. But the authority of John's baptism in preparing the way of the Lord was in God alone. So the message went with the practice of baptism. He says in verse 26, then what does he say? I baptize with water. Now Ezekiel comes to mind, right? I'll wash you and cleanse you and all of these things. Psalm 51, as we see the cleansing of David in a ritualistic sense. But we know that baptism is not salvific. It's not, a, it's not a sacrament. It's not an instrument of grace. And that if we baptize somebody, then they'll go, then they have eternal life. It is by faith alone in Jesus. But here's John saying, I baptize with water. I'm not going to deny that. I baptize Jews in the water because it is a symbol of the one who is here already and what he is going to do and what he has done. Because he says, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. See, this is part of the witness of the light. You may baptize by the authority of God. You see me baptizing by the authority of God as many Jews believe in the message that I preach and the message that I preach is pointing to the light who is the one who shined on their unbelief and made them believe. And now the baptism that they have is just water. It's just to show the world at large that they have been cleansed by the one who came after me, who was before me, who I am not worthy to untie the shoe of. And you might say, where's that? What's that talking about? Well, a slave is the only person who would take off a shoe and clean a foot. And you think, but that's, why would you clean feet? Sandals, desert. Those of us who have kids, we know what, we call it piggly wiggly feet in our house. Because back in the day before you could, you didn't have to wear shoes everywhere. You could go barefooted. And your kids went barefooted and you went barefooted into Walmart. Well, what in Walmart? Roses. You know, and all these nasty, you know, and you get home and your feet would be black. Piggly wiggly feet. And your parents would put you in the bathtub and the bathtub becomes black because your feet. You're not dirty anywhere else, just your feet. Well, in that day, <laughs> it was a lot, my mother's laughing. In that day, there was a lot of, there was a lot of um, dirty feet. And so the only person that would touch a foot to untake off a shoe and clean a foot was a slave. Now, a student of a rabbi, a student of a teacher, would do everything that a slave would do if asked except take off a shoe and clean a foot. And John says, I'm not even worthy to take off the shoe of Jesus. That I'm below and beneath the slave. See the humility there. See the emphatic position that he answers these spiritual leaders coming to inquire by whose authority that he baptizes. He says, there's one among you who you do not know. 
And He is so far greater than me. Though I come in the spirit of Elijah. And he understood that, though he didn't say it himself. Jesus says it about him. I'm not worthy to wipe his feet off. See, Jesus is actually the one baptizing these believers, isn't he? Because the water is just a symbol. Jesus is bringing them into himself. The forgiveness of sins, spiritually, judicially, actually, not just symbolically. Isn't that what the Pharisees got upset with Jesus about? I mean, miracle, <laughs> blind, seeing, dead, being raised. And what do they get upset about? Who are you to say their sins are forgiven? I'm a slave to Jesus, John would argue. And I'm due no glory. I'm unworthy. I'm unworthy. But the operative issue here in verse 26 is that they could not see, remember. They couldn't see. He came to His own, and His own did not receive Him. But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but the will of God. See, as John the Baptist proclaimed the witness of the light, the light saved people from darkness. And they were born of God. God declared and decreed and purposed. God sent the Son. God prepared a, uh, John the Baptist. God called the, the apostles. The apostles, God through the apostles secured the Word. And we are here today because the work of the Gospel of God in Christ is still effectual, still powerful, and nothing can overcome it. And you'll find it interesting to know as we continue in this, that's all we can do today, is that this first chapter and second chapter is only one week. One week of Jesus' ministry. And the first 20 chapters encompass a segmented portion of three, three and a half years. I mean, the, no, first 10 chapters. And the latter part of the whole letter from John 11 through John 21, one week. What's the importance of that? Friends, look what we've gotten thus far today with one conversation. There is no end to learning about the glory of Christ in His Word. I started with this and I will end with this. Let us not forsake the Word of God. Let us not forsake the assembly. Let us not forsake prayer. Because when we do so, we feel disjointed, disconnected, overwhelmed. And we begin to put the focus on ourselves in such a way that we miss out on understanding just what those whom God has called are like. It is not us. It is Him. It is Him. The light. The Christ. The Savior of the world. Believe in what He has done and live. Let's pray. Father, there is much to say. And time in all respects is an enemy of ours.